Hey, everyone, and welcome to this week's coverage of Introduction to the United Nations. Uh, this week, we round out our introduction of the subject by examining the theoretical, the practical, the diplomatic, and the strategic foundations of the UN. Um, therefore, I think it's rather appropriate that we kind of uh, note that, yes, this image does exist if you really wanted to pick it up. I think it's sold in the UN gift shop, but uh, if you wanted a Lego playset of the UN, um, it's right there for the taking. And I think it's a rather emblematic way of looking at how uh, this organization really came into being. And more importantly, how the United Nations really is... Um, a culmination of about 200 years of dedicated efforts at converging, um, at the absolute least, the foreign policies of a number of very important countries uh, into some, uh, you know, collective security framework, which can be used for the purposes of, uh, you know, maintaining peace, uh, regulating different types of diplomatic problems and issues, and, you know, really, in a way, kind of beginning the foundations of what is really an international, uh, you know, governing society like the UN today. So the readings that we are covering this week, um, I really would like to focus on the Jean Krasno um, article, The Founding of the United Nations as an Evolutionary Process, which, you know, if you read, you probably started thinking about halfway through that, you know, there's a lot of you know, specific historical things that just really talk about the communication between diplomats and ambassadors and what does this have to do for our study of the United Nations. Um, I think when we add to that uh, Justin Morris's article from Peace by Dictation to International Organization, we begin to realize that these communiques, these cables, these um, conferences, these little sidebar, um, you know, negotiations between people like Roosevelt and Churchill or Stalin and Roosevelt or whatever, um, really give us an understanding that the foundational aspect of the United Nations is really, if you think about it, not just the vocation of a small handful of countries, maybe even less than five, but really a small handful of individuals I mean, if you want to think about the paradox of where we're going to be going this week, it's that if the United Nations today is seen as this all-encompassing, pervasive, omnipresent international organization that speaks on behalf of everyone and anyone, um, its foundations or, you know, at the absolute least, the conceptual ideas for starting the United Nations um, still knee-deep in the Second World War. Um, was really, in many cases, the negotiated bargaining of a very small group of political actors um, who may very well have wanted to frame the UN within, um, you know, an orientation that upheld and augmented the national security of their own countries, um, but, you know, had the foresight to realize that if it's nothing more than just powerful states using this organization for their own interests, well, then it's going to collapse in the same way that the League of Nations did um, about uh, 10 to 15 years prior. So how do we create something that builds on the errors of the League of Nations um, still, in a way, gives leverage to a small number of countries that, you know, whether you know, empirical evidence dictates or whether their leaders say so themselves um, are much more powerful than others, right? And this is another thing to uh, think about um, as we conceive of international relations is that, um, you know, from a very, very abstract theoretical point of view, um, every state has the same degree of capability in the international arena, right? Each state uh, possesses um, a monopoly on power and authority within and is the highest uh, decision-making body in an otherwise anarchic and um, uncertain international arena. But it's also fair enough to say that there are a handful of countries that have a comparative leverage over others. So while the United States and Chad, for instance, 
are two states that live and exist and function in the international arena. I think it's fair enough to say, right, that the United States is slightly more powerful, <laughs> slightly more of an impact on global politics than the Chadian government does. And so it's not that much of a surprise, right, that the United Nations, which is really an inheritor of institutional arrangements from the previous century and a half, is also very much a, a, a an inheritor of great power politics, right? and continues to be so, especially if we look at the Security Council today, it is reflective of the five major countries that won the Second World War. And um, even though you might think to yourself, you know, well, UK isn't as powerful as it is, as it, is, as it was beforehand, the UK still has veto power. And in that case, it puts the United Kingdom um, at a significant level over comparatively more powerful countries like Germany or France uh, uh, or, or Japan, I'm sorry, or South Korea for that matter. So, you know, with all of that said, right, with all of the things that I'm hoping that you got out of the readings for this week and things that we can talk about in class on Wednesday, I have um, three basic questions to think about, right? They don't have to be answered just now, but it helps you orient the stuff that you read into something tangible and discussable, um, hopefully by the middle of this week. What are the developmental underpinnings of an international organization of global governance like the United Nations? So what goes into, right, what, what goes into its foundation? What goes into its theoretical, its ideological, its moral foundations, right? In so many words, what are the historical and theoretical patterns that we see, um, you know, repeating itself again in the mid to late 1940s that heavily influenced the nature and orientation of the United Nations? And is the UN a unique product of the mid 20th century? Or is it really an evolutionary idea that began, um, you know, a century earlier um, in the immediate aftermath of the defeat of Napoleon? Now, if you think about that, right, if you think, well, you know, it could be, you know, residual patterns of stuff that existed beforehand, well, then obviously there is the you know, very pertinent role of great powers, right? We just kind of put those in quotes, great powers. There are just some countries that have, you know, the military capabilities, the economic technology, the diplomatic wherewithal to, you know, be far more of an influencer on the international arena than others. So what is the role of these great powers in shaping and steering the United Nations um, into the present period. And, you know, this, um, you know, gets us to look a little bit more at the middle article by Morris. You know, how did we go from what Roosevelt had, you know, referred to in the, in the mid-40s as peace by dictation to the international society that we have today? And again, at, at the risk of spoiling the plot before we even get into all of this, right? People like Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin, um, you know, kind of knew what their position was. I mean, these, they were world leaders. They had the diplomatic wherewithal to effectively say if they wanted something, it was going to happen. And if Roosevelt was the one that kind of felt that it was his job to take on the mantle of Woodrow Wilson from a few decades earlier and to say, all right, all right, we're going to do the league this time, but not only is the United States going to be involved, um, the, league, uh, the, the UN is going to be bigger, more robust and not have the same, um, f um, you know, traps of, uh, of dysfunctionality that they had beforehand. And so in that case, FDR, president of the United States, is basically putting his name to this, saying, well, you know, it, the UN will work and function um, largely by what we decide, uh, whether it's at Yalta or Dumbarton Oaks or San Francisco or, you know, whatever. And finally, what is the importance in diplomatic language in reaching consensus, compromise, and cooperation, right? Now, knowing that this class is connected to the language and diplomacy certificate, right, that we are at a prime place to talk about this. And here is where um, the articles this week really come in handy, especially when we note the specific communications between diplomats and ambassadors in trying to um, come to a common understanding of what membership literally means, what independence means, what trusteeship means, and whether trusteeship is going to designate smaller countries as colonies or as independent states, 
And while the terminology might be problematic just in terms of uh, the different ways that they can be interpreted by different countries and different leaders, what's equally problematic is the idea of trying to make certain that the UN Charter uses the right words, the right phrasing, and offers the right meaning in order to get a would-be opposing country to finally agree and sign on to it. So it's not just this idea of interpretation by reading it later on, but the idea of trying to make certain what needs to be said and how things are to be clearly defined and articulated right here in the beginning when we look at great power politics in asking what does it take to get the Russians on board, the Brits on board, and even the French. So there's a lot of things that these readings will hopefully address um, and something that I am really looking forward uh, to us discussing um, in a couple of days. Now, the readings also make note that the UN isn't necessarily something unique. Um, granted, it has a lot more power, a lot more influence and global reach than anything before it. But the United Nations is, in so many words, the culmination of a 200-year experiment in international institutionalism, some kind of regional organization. It doesn't have to necessarily uh, be global, but the development of some kind of transnational institution to organize and coordinate collective interests and policies of states, even if these states are no more than 10 to 15, um, you know, really begin as early as 1815. Um, and some would even say earlier, if you want to go back to, let's say, the medieval period and consider um, the Hanseatic League or some things that come out of the Treaty of Westphalia. But, 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 none of you are, you know, history majors in this class, so I'm going to try to keep it simple. And I'm going to say that the Concert of Europe, the so-called Concert of Europe, which began around 1815 and was... Um, by and large, <clears throat> regulated and administered by, Aust by the Austrian Empire's preeminent foreign minister at the time, uh, Count uh, uh, Prince uh, uh, Metternich, uh, was pretty you know, clear in making certain that there were, at the absolute least, some kind of alliances between the major powers of Europe that dissuaded any one other country from destabilizing the region and going to war. So the Concert of Europe was something that was designed in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars um, immediately to somehow diplomatically isolate France, and this led to um, a tripartite alliance between Great Britain, the Austrian Empire, and Russia. But this Concert of Europe, which effectively lasted pretty stable for about 30 years, basically until the, uh, the Social Revolutions of 1848, um, did a couple of things. Probably and most important, it recognized that there were great powers in the region. And these powers, um, usually numbering around five, Great Britain, France, Austria, Russia, and either the German Confederation or something else like that, but usually somewhere around four or five. Now, there were other countries, to be sure, in Europe at the time, right? Switzerland, Spain, Portugal, um, small emerging countries in the Balkans like Greece and Serbia, but they were considered to be small, peripheral, diplomatically insignificant. So the understanding with the Concert of Europe is that there's already a hierarchical pecking order. There are strong states and there are weak states. And the strong states have additional responsibilities on their hand, foreign policy-wise, to maintain some kind of collective security, power balance, alignment, um, you know, order, and you know, some kind of discipline, right? To prevent um, you know, another war from breaking out. And if you know anything about European history, you, know, you kind of know that Europe has been anything but peaceful uh, since 1815. Um, the Congress of Berlin, which uh, was another major international um, meeting um, that was held, surprise, surprise, in Berlin, um, administered by the then German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, was, among other things, responsible for deciding whether or not new countries in Europe should be recognized. So the Congress of Berlin 
which, among other things, defines and delineates certain diplomatic responsibilities of Austria and Russia um, over a declining Ottoman Empire, also extends formal legal sovereign recognition to three countries, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania. Now, these three countries existed on the map beforehand, and for the most part, they already were independent and sovereign. But what the Congress of Berlin does is that it is the first attempt at extending um, at what was at the time international recognition. And that international recognition also comes with um, recognized borders, right? So the borders are defined not by what the Romanians, the Serbs, and the Montenegrins want, but what the facilitators of the Congress want. And that is, you know, the Germans, the British, the French, uh, the Austrians, and the Russians. Um, it very much was an exercise in great power politics and carries, you know, similar characteristics to the concert of Europe. But what it does also is give us an understanding that from here on out, major international agreements are not just simply because one country declares it to be so, but that there needs to be some kind of meeting of, you know, significant powers to kind of, you know, write up a piece of paper and put it and put in words uh, what other people just think as de facto. So, you know, since the Congress of Berlin, you know, there have been international conferences on commerce, judicial law, conflict resolution, um, you know, universal, um, you know, uh, declarations of human rights. Um, these things are becoming more and more of a trend. Now, of course, when I say international at the time, we're still talking about a world that is largely carved up into colonial holdings. So what passes for international is really um, those independent states that are able to attend these conferences, which, you know, at the time were less than 50. So for the most part, you had, um, you know, central, northern, western, and southern Europe. Uh, you had North America, and you had uh, Latin America. But none of these conferences saw delegates from, you know, African states, maybe Ethiopia, that was about it, uh, but nothing really from the Middle East. And then finally, of course, we get to the League of Nations, which is that, you know, big international organization designed in the wake of the First World War um, with a number of intentions, but one, one of the big ones was to prevent a war of that magnitude from ever happening again. And the League of Nations is really the first real true global organization. Right? The League of Nations oftentimes tends to get uh, somewhat of a bad rap because, well, it collapsed and it utterly failed in um, you know, achieving its objectives. But the League was, you know, the League is important for a couple of things because one, it gives us an understanding of the bugs that need to be worked out in organizations like that. And two, it kind of gave us an understanding of what to avoid and what to fix when the United Nations is, re, you know, is, is built. And you can think about the United Nations as kind of like the League of Nations 2.0. Um, but we're going to make it bigger and faster and stronger, and we're going to have a number of fail-safes in it that prevent uh, the type of internal decay and bureaucratic ineptitude <laughs> that, characterized the, uh, that, that characterized the League. Now, we see a pattern in all of these things, right? So here I'm giving you kind of like the big picture of what we're reading this week. What we see from the concert of Europe up to the formation of the United Nations is the promotion and facilitation of increasingly international ideas, laws, trends, and agreements, but paradoxically by a handful of specific powers and authorities. So the creation of an international outlook is in no small measure the product of a small number of pre-existing states that want to create this international outlook. Now, you can, you know, slice it however, way, however many ways that you want by saying that these countries were visionary, they were forward-thinking, they were based in liberalist principles, and, you know, by and large, they may very well be, I mean, especially if you consider the United States, but at the end of the day, um, it's still great power politics. And if you took away from the readings this week the understanding that a good chunk of the UN's form and function, 
was based on the moods, the negotiation skills, and the compromises made uh, between a handful of Americans, Russians, and Brits, well then, yeah, congratulations. This is how great power politics operates. And so this furthers the understanding that international organizations and agreements are only as strong as states, and here I have to be even more specific, powerful states make them out to be, right? This is just one of those paramount things to understand when the study of international institutions and organizations is considered, right? These things are only as strong, only as effective, only as influential as their member states make them out to be, okay? And even if it is effective, right? Even if it's like, oh, look at what the UN's doing, look at what the EU's doing, look at what NATO is doing. Um, if we understand that principle, that it's what strong states make them out to be, well then, great powers continue to dictate such outcomes. So the United States, Russia, China, even, you know, even, you know, today France, the UK, still have an indelible effect on the way in which the UN works. And so this kind of also tells us that institutionalism is effective mm -hmm. if and only if all participating members are willing to play by the rules of the game. In other words, if great powers continue to look at the international system as nothing more than an arena for them to display their own national policies, well then, yeah, I mean, we're going to see a country like Czechoslovakia carved up. We're going to see injustice happen, human rights violations be committed, because we're not thinking globally, we're still thinking nationally, but just on a global scale. So in this sense, even if the UN or other organizations like it are effective, it is because of the forward-thinking visionary philosophies of people who come from individual member states. So a critical set of questions to then ask if we take all of this um, you know, by faith um, is if an international organization like the UN is supposed to be designed for a global community and address transnational issues and concerns, then why was so much of its original configuration the product of not only a small handful of states, but a small handful of individual statesmen? So, you know, if the UN is designed today and we expect it today to be everywhere, um, why was it that it was, you know, I don't know, what, right place, right time? Um, Stalin was just able to compromise because he wanted to be part of the UN. And what were the enticements? Right, that got the UN, uh, I'm sorry, that got the US and the Soviet Union to be on board. Clearly, one of the enticements was the resurrection of a Security Council in which both countries would have a significant influence on voting patterns. So, what is the role of global powers in designing and shaping a global community? If it is at the best case scenario that the great powers do create an organization that, you know, works for the benefit of all, but the payoff is that we've got a little extra something, something within the organization ourselves, right? We've got black ball veto power at the Security Council. Um, the UN is headquartered in the United States. Uh, one of the primary languages is English. Uh, Russia, it doesn't matter how dysfunctional the country can be, when the Russian delegation delegation speaks at the UN, everybody listens. Um, this obviously puts some countries at a far better position than others. So again, in order to understand this stuff, we turn to theory. And there's two things that really came out of the reading, and it wasn't mentioned, but you know, I've, you know I, I teach a number of classes in IR, and so I think that it's worth bringing up, is that if we go with the idea that, sure, okay, it's great power politics, and it's not that this is even problematic. It's just that countries that are, are as, that are as powerful as the United States um, have some kind of obligation to take responsibility in international affairs. This is something that goes back centuries, not millennia. I mean, some of the, um, I wouldn't even call them classical realists. I would just simply call them the philosophical founders of the school of realism. Uh, Thucydides, who wrote uh, a history of the Peloponnesian War, like back in, you know, God knows how many, is in the BC period, right? At least 3,000 years ago. And Machiavelli, of course, you know, who writes The Prince, right? Both understand that there exists 
some kind of international hierarchy of powers, right? And it doesn't matter whether they like it or not, doesn't matter whether they're in favor of it, they just simply recognize it as such, right? There, it's at, at, at any given moment, there are countries in the world that have a comparative advantage over others, politically, militarily, economically, you know, whatever it is that you want to call it. And it's, you know, strong states versus weak states. And, you know, there's a long description in Thucydides' Peloponnesian War uh, in which the Athenian delegation, you know, the, the Athenian delegation goes to this little Greek city-states of Melos, um, which had uh, declared neutrality <clears throat> in this larger war between Athens and Sparta. And, um, you know, Athens goes to Melos and tells them, your neutrality is actually a security threat. Um, we need you to take a side. And considering that we're here right now, um, we strongly suggest that you take our side. Um, otherwise, we'll use our navy to blockade you and starve you out. The Melians respond back by saying, well, we're neutral. We're not bothering anybody, and we are a free state. We can choose as every way that we want. And the Athenians reply and say, yes, that is true. I mean, you know, you are, you know, your own city-state, your own laws, your own currency, your own this, that, the other thing. But hey, I'm Athens, and I got a big-ass navy, and I can force you to do what I will. And if you were in my shoes, uh, you would be telling me the exact same thing. So strong states have the um, capacity, uh, the capability, and in some cases, if you want to throw in liberalism into all of this, the obligation to shape the world, um, you know, in their image here. Um, and yes, if we stick with a realist standpoint and say, well, they're doing it solely to preserve their national interest, um, you know, there is a way of saying, you know, the national interest could, in a way, benefit the larger international arena. Now, what those benefits are, uh, you know, depend on circumstance and also depend on the country at hand. So if the United States is simply taking a lead and saying that we need a league, of, uh, we need a United Nations for collective security or for um, international economic cooperation or a promoter of uh, human rights and, um, you know, something that condemns, um, you know, the violence of war or whatever it is, well, then fine. You know, the UN, where well, the US will use the UN to um, promote that foreign policy. Um, and this, I think, is extended even further when we look at liberalists who believe that strong powers have this moral imperative, right? A moral imperative to shape the international system for the collective good of all. This was the, um, you know, this was the mantra of Woodrow Wilson and uh, his idea of a League of Nations, which he envisioned the United States taking uh, a major role in leading. But as we all know, right, the United States was not a member of the League. Um, Senate Republicans had actually voted down that resolution um, under the idea that a League of Nations would tether the United States to too many foreign policy uh, commitments. Well, FDR kind of takes it upon himself to say, all right, let's try this again. And this time, because the United States is in a far more paramount position to become a global leader, um, the argument is given that the UN could very much become some kind of instrument for advancing U.S. foreign policy. And this became all the more apparent as, you know, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union began to deteriorate. Stalin was seen as more and more of a belligerent enemy. And the idea was that, well, you know, UN or not, the Soviet Union is going to be a threat. We might as well use this thing um, at the absolute best to bring the Soviet Union into the cooperating group of nations or use the United Nations to condemn them for, you know, a number of, you know, gross violations. So with all of that said, right, there's a couple of things that we can take away, a couple of talking points. Strong states can engage in institutionalism for the purpose of preserving security, advancing specific ideas and interests, while using those institutions to maintain diplomatic and political leverage. Sorry for the typo. Um, strong states can, you know, effectively do both. They can have their cake and eat it too, right? And even if the institution, like the UN, for instance, grows and evolves beyond the original mandate, or more likely, even if the great powers or some of them eventually diminish, right? Um, the institutional function of this organization will hopefully perpetuate 
policy, order, and cooperation long after hegemonic decline, right? It's what we would call the after hegemony effect. So the United Nations, which let's just, if we entertain the fact that the UN was created specifically to uphold and promote the foreign policies and the national interests of the Americans and the British, right? And maybe the French, just run with it, right? I'm not saying that's what it was, but just run with it. If the UN continues to function year in and year out, decade in, decade out, greater degrees of cooperation are found between member states. New members join. The UN ends up getting a large degree of public legitimacy. As I've said before, it's got a lot of uh, positive brand imaging. If a country like the UK or even the United States begins to diminish as a global power, the UN will continue to work. The UN will continue to pump out these policies of cooperation, facilitate um, you know, accommodations of transnational cooperation and trust. And this is, you know, part and parcel of one of the big, you know, arguments of liberalism. Increased cooperation between states leads to, one would assume, increased trust. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all buddy-buddy and there's no spy network, but you are less likely to suspect a trading partner, a cooperative ally of yours, uh, to suddenly turn around and declare war on you. So with an increase in trust um, comes a decrease in uncertainty, uncertainty at the international level in not knowing what other countries are doing or what their motivations are, right? Increased trust doesn't mean that we're going to be completely certain about what's happening in the world. And countries can still hide their motives, but some countries have far less of a need uh, to use that uncertainty to gain some kind of competitive leverage. So decreased uncertainty leads to what we've all been hoping for, a decreased security dilemma. So international institutions like the UN, if designed the right way, can facilitate cooperation and trust, promote a sense of transnational economic trade and interdependency. And it, you know what? If that doesn't eliminate war around the planet, but does a good job of doing that in Europe, right? <laughs> or let's say the Middle East or whatever, well then great. Then the UN has kind of done its job. But where does that all come from? That comes from really the, you know, the foundational ideas and, you know, philosophies and talking points of really a handful of individuals, right? A handful of individuals that decide this is how it is going to be so. And this, I think, helps us explain the shortcomings of the League of Nations, which I don't want to spend too much time on this week, but I just want you to know, right, that this thing existed beforehand. It was located in Geneva. Actually, it's one of the main UN headquarters today. The UN headquarters in Geneva is the old League of Nations building, so we've recycled it, and it's kind of historic, right? The League of Nations, as I've mentioned, was an institution with all the right intentions, but none of the authority supported by the states. So the chief problem was that the United States was not a member. Alongside that were talks that even if uh, the United States was not a member, after he stepped down after his term as president, it was rumored that Woodrow Wilson was going to be offered the league equivalent of secretary general. Unfortunately, Wilson had a stroke, a debilitating stroke, so he never really lived to see the whole thing work. So it was kind of a, a, a disappointing failure. But beyond the non-presence of the United States was the defection of Italy and Japan from the League Council, this was the equivalent of the Security Council, uh, for pursuing their own aggressive foreign policies when the Japanese invade Manchuria in 1931 and Italy under Mussolini invades Ethiopia in 1935. And what this opens up for um, discussion is that national security interests, if they override international collective action, and the international organization does not have the capacity to stop that or punish the states or have any kind of element of enforcement, well, then what's the point in this organization's existence? And, you know, in other classes, this is where I would go into what I call my three strikes about the League of Nations. The Japanese invasion of 1930, Manchuria in 1931 effectively saw um, one country invading another. And, you know, Japan was widely condemned, but nothing really happened. 
The League ended up deciding that they were going to send a fact-finding mission to Manchuria to see what was going on. And the thing is, by the time they actually got there, you got to remember, this is the 1930s, so we're not taking bullet trains and high-speed jets. For the most part, the delegates are taking boats, and that's going to take about a week or so. By the time the delegation actually gets to Manchuria, I mean, the invasion is pretty much over, and the area is being integrated within a new Japanese empire. So the League just kind of decides, well, it's a fate accompli, and the British and the French even go so far as to say, well, Japan was an ally of ours during the First World War. They were denied colonies, so we should just give them this. And not only that, it is the 1930s. The Soviet Union is looking kind of pretty aggressive and threatening. We might as well just keep Japan in our back pocket because they could be a useful ally. And if they want Manchuria, well, then so be it. Same thing actually happens in 35 when the Italians invade Ethiopia, which is equally dastardly because Ethiopia was one of the original signers of the League and widely seen as a sovereign state, whereas China was still kind of, you know, this amorphous, we don't know what it is. Ethiopia was also one of the few, if only, places in Africa that was never colonized. So when the Italians invade, now, you know, the, you know, the League condemns once again, and Italy is placed under um, a number of, at least initially, crippling economic embargoes. The problem with this embargo is that the Italians were prevented from buying finished munitions, but they weren't prohibited from buying aluminum, oil, coal, and all the other raw materials that they could use to make munitions within their own country. Not only that, but countries that, were, you know, that could not sell to Italy or buy from Italy, but more so sell, hurt their economies as well. And that hurts a struggling economy in Austria, Yugoslavia, among others. So there was a lot of, you know, blockade running, um, you know, black market material here or there. And once again, um, once it became known that Italy's integration of Ethiopia was final and complete, the only way to dislodge them was through a war. It's the 1930s. Hitler's looking kind of scary. We need Italy to, you know, effectively be in our corner. The argument, once again, from the British and the French, which the Ethiopians are like, gee, thanks. And then finally, the German partition of Czechoslovakia of 1938. Remember the Munich Conference? The League at this point didn't even have any involvement. This was effectively um, direct um, uh, negotiations uh, between Hitler, uh, Great Britain, and France. Uh, Mussolini came along for the ride, and I think he also found that there was a buffet, so that's why he, you know, he came there. He didn't really do anything. Neither, neither did the French. But Chamberlain, if you remember the whole idea of the Munich Conference, basically said to Hitler, okay, I will give you a piece of Czechoslovakia if you promise to not invade and take over the rest. And Hitler was like, wow, really? I didn't think it was going to be this easy, but okay. And um, agrees to it. And, you know, Chamberlain is like, you know, peace in our time. And everybody is like, what the hell's the matter with you? And, uh, we, you know, within the year, the Germans invade and take over the rest of uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, by that point, no one really pays attention to the League. The war starts the next year. The League is kind of like there. I think people just show up. I think they're cosplaying at this point. But by that point, the League had lost all um, legitimacy and all real internal mandates. So, you know, one of the reasons why the League failed again is very simple. The absence of strong political actors providing some kind of teeth to this organization. This is something that was clearly in the mind of both Roosevelt and Truman, right, after Roosevelt had died. Churchill was definitely on board with this, and even Stalin, interestingly enough, found some utility in a United Nations, at least as, you know, insofar as it was a security organization, because it put Russia on the international map. So in this case, right, the readings are very much telling you that the foundation of the UN, among other organizations, is in no small measure a product of what I will just simply call elite bargaining, right? And you think about this, right? Statesmen, men of power, men of interest, who get together at places like Yalta and Dumbarton Oaks and Tehran and San Francisco, and they literally just sit down for days negotiating how what will eventually be a world government for millions and billions of people are going to function. And if there was one individual that probably had the most to contribute to this elite bargaining foundation of the UN, it would be FDR, right? The United States took on a front and center role, this time in not only proposing 
a brand new international organization, but making certain that this time they were going to be on board, right? Absolutely on board. And one of the things that got them on board very easy was Roosevelt going to the Republicans, some of them the same people that told Wilson to take a hike a couple of years and decades earlier and tell them in no small measure, here's the language, here's the diplomacy, the United Nations will not be a world government. It will not be a super state. The United States, nor any other country, will be subordinated to the UN. In fact, he even went so far as to say that if you get behind this right now, we have got significant leverage in defining the charter, the orientation, and the function of this thing to the point where we're not going to be subsumed by them, but they could be subsumed, the UN, by us. So this internal diplomacy and getting, you know, House, Repu House and Senate Republicans to effectively agree to support an organization that was clearly defined as not a world government and not something that would call for U.S. intervention at every moment's notice was one major foundation for the U.N.'s growth. The second was FDR very early on, and without any real coaxing, felt that it was absolutely strategic to offer cooperation for this thing to both the UK and the Soviet Union, right? It was seen as, you know, the big three, the main allies in the Second World War. Um, obviously, a partnership with UK and the US is not going to be that big of a problem. But bringing someone like Stalin in, and giving him at least the idea that the Soviet Union is going to have a major um, decision-making voice in a post-war world also got them to agree to this early on. Right? You might think to yourself, why would the Soviet Union want to be on board working with uh, the U.S. and the U.K.? And that is, it's, hey, Stalin, you're important, um, literally in so many words here. Um, this goes a long way in demonstrating the willingness of Roosevelt to engage in post-war multilateralism. And, you know, beyond just simply stoking, you know, Stalin's ego, the understanding was if the Soviet Union is on board immediately, the idea of multilateralism, the idea, all those liberalist principles of cooperation, the reduction of uncertainty, transnational um, trust and interdependency would kind of take out the worst elements of the Soviet Union and maybe even tame them, right? Maybe even bring them on board to be more cooperative, and this was extended one step further when the notion was made to bring in both the French and the Chinese. Now, the Americans wanted the Chinese because they saw them as a natural ally against the Japanese. And they also felt that as an emerging power, right, China could be um, a key ally um, in American interests in East Asia. The Brits wanted the French on board uh, for no other reason than Churchill wanted to make Europe important again. And, you know, while British history, um, you know, has a love-hate relationship with the French, sometimes even more so than the Germans do, um, the understanding was giving France great power politics, which made them, you know, a permanent member of the Security Council, and along with the Chinese, um, some voice in maybe not coming up with ideas for the UN, but agreeing and having strong agreements or disagreements with things that had already been written, uh, the idea was that the French were going to counterbalance the Germans in Europe. And the French would be so grateful that they were brought on to this that they would be seen as a natural ally uh, by the British. So you kind of already see the power and the leverage that certain countries have um, over smaller countries that for, by and large, we're told, hang on a second, when we get this charter written, we'll send you a copy so you can read it and sign it and be on board here, right? So what we are looking at this week is really the importance of sort of the founding fathers model. And this is a very conservative structural approach to institution building. It happens in IOs. It also happens in formal national governments, right? You can kind of look at the United States, for instance, and, you know, view that, you know, our last, you know, nearly 250 years of our history, um, really the first 175 were the vocation of a very small cadre of individuals, right? Urban dwellers, intellectuals, aristocrats that couldn't care less what the masses think, what women think, what minorities think. We're going to just write this constitution, 
And if we feel that it doesn't go far enough, the very same people are going to come up with the Bill of Rights. These things are amendments to the whole thing. And uh, this is just how it's going to be. And once the rule of law, once political society, once a bureaucracy is set in, then participation within this previously exclusively debated institution can now be accessible to everybody. But you play along by the rules that have already been enumerated. And that's where, you know, the founding fathers, they meet at Dumbarton Oaks, they meet again at Yalta to ratify and harmonize the things that were initially made up in Dumbarton Oaks. Then there's the San Francisco Conference, which finalizes it one step further. I mean, you know, the UN is basically about ready uh, to go. And in all of these situations, right? We note the direct negotiation between heads of states. Um, you know that famous picture of Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill sitting on the chairs there, whatever it is? I mean, they did more than just simply pose for a photo. Uh, you know, they talked about a post-war European arrangement, but they also framed that post-war arrangement within the framework of an emerging United Nations. And so it's within these conferences that these ambassadors, these intellectuals, and these heads of state create the structural foundations, the institutional functions, and define the role of member states for this organization, both large and small. Um, this is not a constitution written by a wiki. This is not a democratic arrangement. This is very much the vocation of a small group of powerful individuals. And so once the meeting at San Francisco, once the conference of April 1945 is met, much of what had already been designed and shaped are now just going for final revisions and implementations, defining the concept of membership, the function of the General Assembly and the Security Council, the role of this thing that the Brits and the French are really afraid of, this thing called the trusteeship. What does that mean for their existing colonies, even as late as 45? The role of the Security Council and the power of the members, including the veto vote, Right. One of the things that, you know, finally got the Soviets and the Americans to sign on. And this is one of the things that Roosevelt probably mentioned to congressional Republicans is that if we sign on, we've got blackball veto. Right. Which gives the United States um, a unique position um, along with four other countries in shaping, designing and pressuring, um, you know, foreign policy. The role of the Secretary General, the, fr the framework of the use of force. And in all of these debates, from Tehran to Dumbarton Oaks to Yalta to now, okay, all of these debates, all of these meetings included right, discussions on the important use of symbols, wording, and meaning. All of them were critical in reaching agreements. In this point, folks, not just in making certain that the UN Charter was clear, but making certain that the great powers continued to cooperate, right? So the idea of defining the trusteeship council and whether or not that means that existing colonies of the British and French colonial systems suddenly go, under, go in there or continue to remain colonies, this is very, very important. What about the role of colonies that were partially liberated during the war when the host country, like France, was taken over, like Lebanon and Iraq and Syria, um, Lebanon and Syria, I'm sorry. Do these countries go back to the trusteeship council as colonies or because they signed on to the declaration as what they felt were independent states, does that make them full-fledged UN members? And if you are a member of the UN, right, are you someone else's property? Or are you a separate, sovereign, independent state? You, you know, these things seem trivial in 2021, but the definitions and the descriptions were absolutely paramount in getting, you know, in getting a number of would-be countries to sign on. So the thing to understand here, folks, is that in all of these debates, right, the importance of symbol, wording, and meaning were all critical in reaching agreements, right? especially in the first few um, years before the UN is even founded, getting the wording down, getting the terminology down for a UN charter, finding out what needs to be included what was previously disregarded and what smaller developing countries feel is absolutely necessary to be part of the charter. These are all things that are debated, contested, and ultimately agreed upon. And so that's why I think one of the key things to look at 
in the early stages of the construction of the UN is the tackling of this issue of trusteeship, which is interesting because today um, this is the one official subunit of the United Nations that has little to no formal role anymore. Um, I, you know, I remember teaching in my intra organization class last semester. The trusteeship council is probably one of the cushiest jobs that you can have, if you know, jobs even exist anymore, um, because the trusteeship council is. Well, it's, it's, it's two things. First is it is a direct inheritance from the League of Nations, which a trusteeship council back then was designed to handle a number of um, colonies of defeated powers of the First World War. And rather than give them independence, um, you know, much to the opposition of the British and the French, the understanding was that these former colonies would become league mandates, right? So they would kind of be under the administrative direction of the League of Nations. But because the League didn't have the capacity to be any kind of government, the League then kind of rented out or delegated this responsibility of these former colonies to existing colonies. Um, or existing uh, surrounding, uh, you know, territorial holdings. So, for instance, um, you know, British, uh, I'm sorry, German Southwest Africa, which today is the country of Namibia, um, was detached from, well, Germany got no colonies after the First World War, and was attached to British South Africa for administrative control and caretaking, right? Because the understanding was um, none of these countries, none of these people are ready. They don't have the capacity to become a modern state. But I think another hidden thing was um, if we give these former colonies independence that early on, you know, that's going to sort of trigger a uh, what about me um, movement throughout the remaining British and French territories. So obviously the idea of trusteeship comes back up um, as the UN is being uh, constructed, uh, primarily just because of what to do with these league mandates. Um, and the minute that the concept of trusteeship comes up again, the British and the French are very, very um, adamant about making certain that this does not affect their own colonies, right? Because everybody is talking now about a global society. Everybody's talking about, you know, self-determination and human rights and, you know, a just global community. Um, and, you know, the British and the French are certainly talking about this as well, but they're sort of thinking to themselves, sure, but every everything except my own colonies, right? If, you know, one of the readings, Churchill was just absolutely adamant about saying, right, I was not tasked to uh, be the prime minister of this country to see its empire, um, you know, collapse, just, not even out of military defeat, but just because of some, you know, international agreement. So in order to get the trusteeship council um, on board for a modern UN, um, U.S. diplomat, Al, you know, Alger Hiss, and you remember from the readings, you know, was very adamant about suggesting that, quote-unquote, the territories in trusteeship shall be territories mandated under the League, territories detached from the Axis powers, and such other territories as any member nation may wish to place in trusteeship, right? So the wording here which was deliberately designed to get the British and, by extension, the French on board, extended an earlier League understanding, right, in that if you lost the war, right, you lost your colonies. Um, and so while, you know, Germany didn't have any at the time, um, Japan, of course, is now going to be faced with this, right, specifically with um, the issue of Manchuria, the island of Taiwan, um, and the Korean Peninsula. But this was meant to say to the British and the French, this will not touch your colonial holdings. So they were okay with that, and that suddenly got them to sign on. Until, right, um, the Iraqi delegation kind of brought up a rather prickly issue, and that was the disputed status of Lebanon and Syria. Because France was officially defeated in the Second World War, at least, you know, during the German invasion. And so during that time, right, France loses its colonial capacity to govern many of its Middle Eastern mandates, chief of which were Lebanon and Syria. And by the time the San Francisco Conference is held, there are delegates from the Lebanese and Syrian governments that are acting under the assumption that they're independent, 
Now, it hasn't been, you know, fully, you know, codified just yet, but they signed on to, right, the San Francisco Declaration. So the Iraqi delegation is kind of saying here, well, you know, what about Lebanon and Syria? I mean, are they going to go to trusteeship? Because if that's the case, they're actually losing their status right now. Um, or will they be reverted to French colonialism, as was French Indochina? This is another thing, is that, you know, once the Japanese are defeated in Southeast Asia, France immediately, you know, comes back in to what, you know, would eventually become Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and says, well, you know, hey, it's good to be back. Let's pick up where we left off, you know, colonial-wise. And the locals are like, uh, no, <laughs> no, not really. And that's, you know, a separate issue here. So, you know, the Iraqi delegation... Um, noted, right, that the Arab countries, and I'm, again, I'm taking this directly from the readings, Arab countries propose that there should be something mentioned in the Charter of the United Nations that these countries should never be considered under the trusteeship system of the United Nations, but should be treated as independent since they already have been participating in the San Francisco Conference. The matter was taken to the steering committee. It was suggested to add a special article, Article 78, which states, the trusteeship shall not apply to territories which have become members of the United Nations. Again, it seems like fine print. It seems like we're really splitting hairs here. Um, but again, because this is connected to this larger certificate, right, words do matter. Terminology matters. Putting it in writing matters. And this was a way of assuaging, right, the Lebanese and the Syrian delegation that you signed on to the United Nations, therefore you do not apply for trusteeship council. Right? So that was, you know, one additional step taken. But once that happened, and once it was clear that certain territories do not become a trusteeship of the UN, then the next issue was what is the status of these countries? Are they independent fully in the same way as the United States and the UK and France and Paraguay and Mexico are? Or are they still in some kind of governmental halfway house that is under some jurisdiction of the parent state, right? And you know, this applies also to countries like India, right, or Nigeria, and so this issue was really taken up by the head of the Philippine delegation, General Carlos Romulo, um, who was really pushing for the inclusion of the word independent within the UN Charter. So in one of his you know, comments here, he notes that in the trusteeship committee, we were discussing a proposal of the superpowers or the colonial powers then, that the aspiration of non-self-governing peoples should be self-governant. I oppose that. I said, that's not complete. Their aspiration should be self-government or independence because self-government is not independence. Well, we had a real fight on that. We discussed the point for two nights. Finally, we won. It's self-government or independence. And I don't remember the number of votes, but I think in the committee, we won by 12 to 14 votes. Now, you might think to yourself again, are we spending you know too much time on minute additions, just a word here or there, or can we just simply assume that this is what it means? Well, again, you know, if you are on the opposite side of this and you really want to know, you know, what is the status of my country? Do I have full, um, you know, self-determination independence? Well, I want that written down, right? Put it in writing, right? And so these things which today, once again, seem commonsensical, they seem pretty obvious, you got to remember, we're dealing with the construction of a transnational institution where a number of the great powers are either colonial powers still or, like the United States, sympathetic towards the colonial powers. And again, as a side note here, um, this is not in the readings, but at the UN delegation, right, at the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, Ho Chi Minh effectively repeated his same tragic historical experience that he did at the end of the First World War. Ho Chi Minh and a number of Vietnamese go to Versailles at the end of the First World War, petitioning Wilson, 
to extend principles of self-determination to them rather than having them be part of the French colonial system. And there is no evidence to suggest that the letter or any outreach to Wilson ever reached Wilson's desk or Wilson's ears. The man does the same thing again in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, only this time petitioning Truman. And once again, there's no evidence that Truman ever heard of or read any petition from the Vietnamese delegation. But what is known is that the United States officially was in favor of a French colonial restoration, despite the fact right, that many of the locals of Southeast Asia right, fought in resistance movements, fought in resistance of national liberation. So for their country to now all of a sudden be reverted to colonialism, right, this is a problem that's going to you know, reoccur again in a couple of years. So the thing to understand here is the importance of words and meaning, right? The, the defining and the delineation of the role of the trusteeship council to either continue administering pre-war league mandates or include current colonies. Right? Because if the idea was to include current colonies, this is the reason why the British were very much against this, it implies that these colonies are soon to be independent states. So the British are very adamant about making certain that the original function of a UN trusteeship council is simply to continue the existing policies of what the League of Nations was given uh, a few decades beforehand. The inclusion of things just simply as independence, because this, once again, definitively ends the nature of colonialism. You can kind of see, right, that there are pressures from the developing world, from the global south, from the, you know, from the lesser powerful nations um, in making certain that the wording and the terminology of an organization that they want to become members of, if it doesn't give them sovereignty immediately, it opens up the pathway for that, right? If it ensures that former colonies like Lebanon and Syria are not just going to be UN members, but are going to be full participating members of the General Assembly, then this needs to be implemented. This needs to be, you know, absolutely uh, defined and understood collectively. And, you know, even when it comes to broader things that today we also take for granted, like human rights, Concepts of human rights were not included initially in the UN Charter. The UN Charter, at least as far as the great powers were concerned, was supposed to be a, an organization of collective security. Right? That was it. The idea of adding a uh, humanitarian um, social welfare um, aspect to the UN is really in no small measure due to the Latin American delegation. Right? And not just the delegates themselves, but a number of civic groups, <clears throat> church groups, labor groups, business organizations, um, you know, women's movements, all of them insisting that the need to include the phrase to ensure respect for human rights without distinction as to race, sex, condition, or creed be incorporated into the UN Charter. So the, uh, the, you know, the understanding here is that the UN Charter is going to be more than just an organization, as I've said already, of collective security, but it has to have some robustness to it. If it is going to be an organization that the developing world is signing on to, they don't simply want to be part of an organization that works to the benefit of a handful of great powers in maintaining some kind of military alliance or some modern day concert of Europe, right? The idea is that the United Nations is no longer a vocation of just the great powers. It is no longer focused on Europe, but it needs to also take the rest of the world into account. And as such, right, and, you know, an additional clause on human rights and human development must be added, right? right? Even as something as visually symbolic as the UN flag and how to project the world on that flag was debated. So, you know, if you know the UN flag today, you know that, you know, it's one of those, um, you know, light blue uh, colors with uh, you know, a, a geographic map of the world superimposed um, between two um, olive branches. The original version of that flag depicted the world as if one was looking down directly from the North Pole, 
right? So all of the uh, geographic landmass of North America, Europe, and Asia would be represented, um, but a good chunk of the Southern Hemisphere was cut off. And once it became known, right, that more and more countries signing on to this were coming from the so-called Global South, um, it became apparent that we needed to change the flag away to make it less Eurocentric, right, to make it uh, less Atlanticist, and to include larger areas of the world. Again, most of this because Argentina suddenly becomes a member, um, you know, after the San Francisco conference, and we don't want to have a flag where one of its members is not depicted. So something as simple as inclusion and geography is also very much important within not just communicating diplomacy, but visualizing it, displaying that diplomacy. So, you know, what do we take away from these readings? I mean, initially, a lot of the things that we read might have sounded, as I've been saying, sort of trivial or things that, you know, we're splitting hairs over, stuff that, you know, really should just, you know, come out in some committee agreement. But what we find is that the United Nations, the, the, the foundation of the UN is really a top-down, what I like to call a top-down collaborative project from, you know, peace by dictation, which was something that FDR had, one, had at one point said, uh, to really a cooperative concert. So what do I mean here? I mean that the initial idea for constructing the UN is really the vocation of great power interests. Um, but great power interests in creating an international society of cooperation, dialogue, and interdependency. So it's really, you know, a good case of classical liberalism, right? States that have the capacity to do good in the world, states that have the capacity to lead by example, um, should use that great power opportunity to shape and direct and orient um, as much of the international community as possible um, in which smaller, weaker states right, will follow through, right? They will follow within that uh, structure. So it's very much, um, you know, an old conservative model of, um, you know, elite bargaining, elite contestation first, and then participation second, right? The idea of the United Nations begins really as an elite-driven initiative um, in laying down the foundations of the organization. Hence, all of the specific details from the Dumbarton Oaks Conference, the Yalta Conference, and then ultimately the San Francisco Conference, which finally invites everybody else there, but we're not coming up with new ideas, we're just simply refining the stuff that has been discussed previously, okay? So it expands to more input from members in San Francisco, and it follows very much, you know, sort of a founding father model in which a group of individuals sort of come up with the framework, the skeletal framework, the rubrics, the rule of law, the constitution, or whatever it is, of some kind of system of government. Um, it is not a, you know, mass democratic initiative, right? We don't want the comment sections uh, having some kind of input on how the article is going to be written. Once the framework is designed and agreed upon, it is then presented out to the rest of society for them to accept, maybe have a few cosmetic critiques, right? Um, and if all that's really happening is that we are talking about the wording and not adding another institution or not changing the specific roles and obligations of said institution, well then the great power element of institution building has done its part. And, you know, from an IR theoretical standpoint, it is somewhat unique in pointing out that great power politics, which is oftentimes considered more so in the realist school, um, has done a significant amount of, con of, of, of work in providing an altogether liberal institutionalist framework. And in this situation, the United Nations, which is much more inclusive and integrative and global in its outlook than any previous incantation of international institutionalism, still begins 
with the understanding that there is a handful of powers that use their leverage, their authority, their regional hegemony, influence, whatever you want to call it, to define and shape a set of you know, interlocking, interdependent, cooperative natures between states, big and small, to operate in for the foreseeable future. And this is, you know, I think a great way for us to, um, you know, end our discussion for this week and segue into the material next week where we look a little bit more into the theoretical underpinnings of the UN Charter, the UN's mission, its outlook, and what it has accomplished in the last 70 or so years. So keep up with the readings, everyone. I hope to uh, get some really interesting input from you later on this week. And other than that, um, you know, enjoy the snow as it is uh, falling down outside my window right now. And uh, I will see you all very, very soon. All right? Take care, everyone.